friends and lovers of literature, in a hot afternoon, uh, summer, assembled in Taj Bengal for this beautiful session of Authors Afternoon yet again. So thanks for uh, making it and thanks for coming out with good numbers. Um, as you all know, that uh, most of you know that uh, the Prabhakaritan Foundation uh, you know, does this beautiful uh, uh, book reading session uh, month by month at the Taj Bengal and uh, we are happy to partner with it along with uh, T2 uh, Telegraph and uh, Sri Simens. Uh, today we have, uh, and uh, if, I may, if I may assume that this is probably the youngest author uh, that we have had in uh, this afternoon, uh, uh, Manu S. Uh, welcome Manu to, and uh, thank you for agreeing to come and uh, do this session with us. Uh, uh, Manu is going to talk about this book and in talks with uh, Manu is going to be Ms. Jayan Silliman, who is uh, associate uh, uh, Associate Professor of Women's Studies at uh, the University of Iowa. Was. So, well, you were your street. Was. All right. Uh, we are pleased to have you here as well. We are looking forward to a lovely session. So, enjoy the afternoon. Thank you. Hello, everybody. I think you're really in for a treat because um, he did introduce you as uh, introduce Manu as one of the youngest authors, but he's such a brilliant writer. It's really wonderful to read his work. He writes as if he's born to writing and with a great deal of experience. So I'm going to just start off by asking him um, to do a little bit of reading of, from his book. But first, what, you'd want, what made you want to write this book? First, thank you very much for being here. Thank you for the uh, great sponsorship from the Prabha Khaitan Foundation. It's quite a privilege, actually, because I was reading up about Prabha Khaitan and her memoirs, and I was quite touched that you know, the, uh, the foundation decided to organize this event because my book is about two very strong, interesting, fascinating, somewhat controversial women as well. And you know, it, it seems to be the perfect home to be discussing a book about women uh, at a foundation named after a very interesting woman. Uh, now coming to the question, so the thing is my parents are Madhyadis, but I grew up outside Kerala in Maharashtra. So for me, uh, Kerala was always something, a holiday home, we went there every summer visited my grandparents there and so on. And every time we went there, I would realize how the history we were taught in school had nothing to do with the realities of history we saw there. For instance, in school we were taught things like uh, widow remarriage was this great social reform here and how you know, the plight of Indian widows, you know, very generalization, Indian widows were led such dreary, monotonous, unhappy lives. And then I'd go home and my grandmother would say, oh, you know, you had a great, great grandmother who was a divorcee in the 1880s. And she was a very pious, you know, orthodox woman. But in Kerala, divorce wasn't a problem. The matrilineal system gave women lots of privileges and freedoms. She owned property. Her husband was kicked out because he wasn't quite up to the mark. And she took a second husband, who in turn had another wife. And he, this woman was apparently so pretty, my great-great-grandmother, that he abandoned his first wife and son and came over to this side. So, you know, these were the stories we read and we heard from our grandparents. And there was this, there was the other thing was there was this temple in our backyard. It was in ruins because our family went the communist way, very much like, you know, Bengal did. And uh, at one point we stopped doing pujas there. We thought it was backward and so on. So we'd go on holidays and find this ruined temple in Kerala in our backyard. And the stories there fascinated me, the legends and so on. There were these two goddesses there. And apparently, so the two goddesses are consecrated in the same temple, but they hate each other. So that was the irony because apparently... One is Durga in her warrior form, the other is Durga in her peaceful form. And the two can't stand each other. And every now and then one of the goddesses <laughs> runs away from this temple and goes to another temple that belongs to a Brahmin family on the other side and visits that particular Devi or whatever. So these stories sort of gripped me and I decided, oh, you know, Kerala is definitely worth exploring and, you know, investing in. And that's how I began uh, working on this. And, you know, but in 2009 I came across the Maharani of Travancore's private papers. And that opened up an entire world of court intrigues and yeah, a lot of drama, uh, which I thought would make a very compelling setting to tell a wider history of Kerala in. So yeah, that's how it all began. Manu, can you read us a little bit from your book so people get a sense of how easy this book is to read, even though it's uh, steeped in history and documents, as so you get a sense of what Kerala was like? Thank you. Uh, so I don't normally prefer doing readings, but Yael insists that I do it, so I'm going to read to the best of my abilities. Just a short piece. Yeah. So, in July 1497, when Vasco da Gama set sail for India, King Manuel of Portugal assorted a distinctly expendable crew of convicts and criminals to go with him. After all, the prospects of this voyage succeeding were rather slender, considering that no European had ever advanced beyond Africa's Cape of Good Hope, let alone reached the fab fabled spice gardens of India. 
Da Gama's mirthless quest was essentially to navigate uncharted, perilous waters, and so it seemed wiser to invest in men whose chances in life were not especially more inspiring than in death. Driven by formidable ambition and undaunted spirit, it took Da Gama ten whole months full of dangerous episodes and gripping adventures to finally hit India's shores. It was the dawn of a great new epoch in human history, and this pioneer knew he was standing at the very brink of greatness. Prudence and experience, however, dictated that in an unknown land, it was probably wiser not to enter all at once. So one of his motley crew was selected to swim ashore and sensed the mood of the natives before the captain could make his triumphant choreographed entrance. And thus, ironically, the first modern European to sail all the way from the west and to set foot on Indian soil was a petty criminal from the gutters of Lisbon. For centuries, Europe, Europe had been barred direct access to the prosperous east, first politically when international trade fell into Arab hands in the 3rd century, and then when the emergence of Islam erected a religious obstacle in the 7th century. Fruitless wars and bloodshed followed, but not since the heyday of the Greeks and Romans had the West enjoyed steady contact with India. Spices and other oriental produce regularly reached the hungry capitals of Europe, but so much was the distance, cultural and geographic, that Asia became a sumptuous cocktail of myth and legend in Western imagination. It was generally accepted with the most solemn conviction, for instance, that the biblical Garden of Eden was located in the east, and that there thrived all sorts of absurdly exotic creatures, like unicorns, men with dogs' heads, and supernatural races called the apple smellers. Palaces of gold sparkled in the bright sun, where precious gems were believed to casually float about India's serene rivers. Spotting phoenixes, talking serpents, and other fascinating creatures was a mundane, everyday affair here, according to even the most serious authorities on the subject. But perhaps the most inviting of all these splendid tales was that lost somewhere in India was an ancient nation of Christians ruled by a sovereign whose name, it was confidently proclaimed, was Prester John. So I think I'll leave the reading there. But then it goes on to talk about how there were Christians in India long before Christianity reached even the outskirts of Europe and so on. And yeah, then that, that's from the first chapter which sort of sets a historical uh, you know, context. It explains the basic history of Kerala till the arrival of the uh, colonial powers in the, in the 16th century. And then thereafter, I sort of use the uh, court drama between these two sisters, who you see here with their very interesting hairstyles, and you know, build up the next four centuries through this battle for power between sisters and the two Maharanis of Travancore. Well, I think the reading gives you a sense of how easy the book is to read. You're really going to enjoy it because you get a sense of Kerala, but you also get a wonderful insight into these two very dramatic women that he writes about. Of course, the main character is Setu Lakshmi, Lakshmi Bai. Bai. And um, could you say a little bit about why you were intrigued by her? I was certainly intrigued by her because she was a traditionalist, she was a modernist, she was an extremely private figure. She did a lot for the country in a very short reign of seven years. So can you talk about um, the layered personality, but also what drew you to, to tell this story? It was uh, one of those, what they call a human interest story, because this was a woman who becomes queen of five million people at the age of five. So overnight, she's exalted to this position in, in a court that's very orthodox. Everything's protocol. So she walks into a room, and everyone's standing. Nobody talks to her. No, her fa own father doesn't sit in her presence. Everyone calls her her highness and so on. By 30, she's ruling over these people. Uh, unfortunately, she champions not the Hindu elite and the old aristocracy, but the entrepreneurial class, the, uh, the minorities, the Dalits. And naturally, that means her policies aren't very fashionable with the dominant elites. So by the time she's in her 40s, she's isolated at court. She loses power to her nephew, who's very much a Hindu consolidationist. And in her 50s, independence means that this whole state of Travancore overnight, it's disappeared, it's wiped out of history. And at 62, this woman who's spent all her life from the age of five as queen and knows no other way of living, she gives it all up. You know, sells her palaces, gives it all to the government. One becomes her summer palace is the agricultural university. Her official residence becomes a medical research facility. She gives it all up, moves to Bangalore and becomes a nobody there. Like she abandons her string of 15 titles and becomes simply Srimati Setu Lakshmi Bai. And in her 80s, she dies in Bangalore and she's cremated at the Wilson Garden Electric Crematorium in a queue of dead bodies like anybody else. So it's quite a rise and fall sort of a very dramatic story. And as you said, she had so many layers. On the one hand, she was an establishment figure, very orthodox, very conservative, always dressed in spotless white, you know, not, not, not even a little bit of makeup on her other than her tikka. So she's very, you know, traditionalist in that sense. But the policies she sort of put in place are still bearing out in Kerala. 
Kerala's literacy rate owes a lot to her because she put uh, one-fifth of the state's revenues at the disposal of the education department. Uh, women, when she came to power, there were no women in government. For, uh, within five years, there were 500 women. Clerks, secretaries. She opened up the legal profession, which is what allowed Anna Chandi to become the first legal uh, luminary in the entire Anglo-Saxon world. She went on to become a judge. Uh, she she uh, promoted the first filmmaker in Kerala. And when the actress, a Dalit woman, played uh, an upper caste uh, role, people started pelted her with stones and things, and this woman gave her police protection. She removed women from working merely as nurses and teachers and gave them proper jobs. She nominated them to the legislature. And in fact, her own Devan or Prime Minister complained by the end of four years that, you know, we had a problem with male unemployment and now we have a Travancore Ladies Graduate Association <laughs> clamoring for women's employment as well and asking for more and more government opportunities to be thrown open to them. So she was a, a modernizer in that sense, but a personally very orthodox woman. And again, the kind of court culture that existed around her was really fascinating because it's a world that doesn't exist anymore. That, you know, when she, as I said, when she walks into a room, people bow, not once, seven times, starting, you know, the sky ending at the floor. And you're not supposed to look at her. Everyone's supposed to stand like that in front of her so your breath doesn't pollute the woman. Uh, you know, when she goes out, there's lots of guards and, you know, soldiers following her everywhere. She has no privacy. She was a queen all through her life. And that whole rise and fall story was obviously very gripping. When I was 19, I thought I you know, found a real treasure because it was worth telling this story. And because she championed the wrong groups in history and politics, she was written out of history. Okay, would you talk a little bit about um, how she was um, ousted from power or her sister took over and what came after? So we have a sense of you know, her rule, get a sense of what, we have a sense of what she achieved and how unique a woman she was and how she was able to balance so many different forces. And then sort of a more lackluster reign of her nephew, yeah. isn't it? So can you talk a little bit about that? So the fascinating thing about this vendetta between these two sisters is that it was also a demonstration of how the matrial union system was in its last gasps of breath and you know, was essentially dying. So the feud between them, as I said, began in their grandfather's generation. And the two women, the Malayalis, if you go to Trivandrum, they'll tell you it began with something called Saundarya Panakam, which is beauty wars. Because the senior Maharani was better looking and the junior was not so good looking. But the thing was, I mean, that's a little bit of a simplification. The actual fact was the senior Maharani was always senior. So she was always first. And she was something of a reluctant princess. She never wanted to be first. She never wanted to be in a position of authority. But having become senior Maharani, she thought it was her duty, a very old-fashioned sense of you know, going about the world. So she thought, I am the Maharani, I have a certain duty. So I, she became an establishment figure. The junior Rani was bursting with unorthodox expression. So for her, culture and tradition gave her no space because she was always junior. She was always stuck in her reclusive elder sister's shadow. So she started looking for spaces where she could do things in a different way. So there was already, even as children, there was a clash beginning between the two girls because their personalities were very different. One was this textbook good princess. Her, if you read her tutor's reports, they all say, oh, she's got great respect for authority. She aces all her exams. The other one was, you know, playing golf and she's pregnant, going out horse riding, and she's not, not giving a damn really about a lot of things. Her son in the 1930s um, was leading this pious ceremonial where they take the god out for a religious procession. And she's here drinking whiskey with her guests and they're all watching, you know, uh, having alcoholic drinks served in the middle of the Second World War when there was rationing. And uh, the reason we know this is because the American ambassador there actually noticed where on earth is she getting all this good whiskey from. So she was a very different character. But what really m sort of muddied the waters was the arrival of the senior Maharani's husband. She was so influenced by Victorian values and mores that she started thinking that, oh, I need to give my husband a good status because he's my husband. I need to walk a step behind him. So the, again, this is one of those ironies of matrilineal Kerala. So to put it simplistically, the Maharaja's wife is not the Maharani. The Maharaja's sister is the Maharani. The Maharaja's wife and the Maharani's husband are commoners. Even if they're married to the king and queen, they are at once also their subjects. So the Maharani's husband could not sit in her presence. He had to refer to his wife as your highness. If they had to travel, it was essential he traveled in a less stately carriage behind her. If by some breach of protocol they ended up in the same car, it was essential he sat opposite her, not next to her. Uh, at banquets in the palace, the Maharani and her children ate, they were, they were served four kinds of desserts. The Maharani's husband got two. Every time the Maharani went out, the guards at the gate would blow the trumpet and play the state anthem. Every time the Maharani's husband... So in every sense, the husband's status was always inferior. Senior Rani, on the other hand, Sethu Lakshmi Bhai decided, oh no, we're in the 20th century, I'm a progressive woman, progressive establishment woman, mind you. So she thought, oh, my husband must have status. Junior Rani said, he may be senior's husband, but he's still my subject. So he has to bow to me. So 
So senior's husband started resenting the junior because he said, I'm not going to bow to my wife's sister because she's the younger sister. Junior would retort saying, what nonsense, you're a consort. They were not even called husbands, they were only called consorts. You have no status in the family. When husbands died, their bodies were sent back and the wives and children did not attend the funeral. So they, because they had absolutely no position, they weren't even allowed to die in the palace. Before that, they were removed from the palace because their bodies weren't considered holy enough to pass away or to exist in a dead form in the, in the palace premises. So there was a feud between this new man entering the scene and he started getting a sort of inflated sense of his own importance in the scheme of things, which his wife encouraged. But Junior Rani, on the other hand, thought, no, in the matrilineal system, the husband has no status. I'm not going to allow this man to, you know, corner rights and privileges like this. So the feud began on a very petty sort of, uh, you know, palace politics and uh, sort of matter of protocol and custom and tradition and so on. But then what happens is, in 1924, the then ruling Raja dies. The junior Rani is produced, the male heir to the throne. The senior Rani only has two daughters. So the daughters are important to continue the line in future because it all goes through daughters. But the sons are who instantly inherit the throne. Unfortunately, the junior Rani's son is only 12 years old. So power passes not to the junior Rani's son, but to the senior Rani as regent. So this obviously exacerbates the, 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 the little gap in the palace and this cleavage of interest between the Maharani's begins to widen because power goes to the senior on behalf of the junior son. So then the junior embarks on black magic and trying to get the Hindu to pray, print all sorts of horrible things about her sister and paying assassins to go and you know, get rid of her husband and things like that. So th there's a lot of court intrigue that sort of uh, you know, builds up around these two women. They can't see eye to eye. When one visits the other's palace for a banquet, she carries her own food cooked by her own cooks because she's afraid that her sister will poison her. So there's all this happening. And then in 1931, the senior Rani's regency ends, the junior son comes to power. And then as the British resident very dryly remarks, La Revanche begins, the junior Rani's revenge. So then she slowly starts diminishing her sister, the senior Rani's position at court. So senior Rani, at one point, the senior Maharani was always equal to the Rajas. So in the uh, 17th century, power in Travancore, the old kingdom of Travancore is divided into two halves. The southern half was ruled by the senior male in the family. The northern half, called Artingal, was ruled by the senior female in the family. And the women were always more spirited than the men. There were cases of the Ranis led their own soldiers into battle. And there are instances of them taking 20,000 uh, 20, soldiers and going to war against their own brothers in the south. When ships were wrecked off the coast of Trivandrum, before the Raja's men could reach there, the Rani's people would reach uh, the coast over there. They'd take up all the wreckage and take it to the Rani's capital. And the Rajas would send messages saying, oh, by the way, this, you know, the ship was wrecked in my part of the kingdom. You should give me all the material. And then she'd go and invade him again and you know, the Raja would fly away because he couldn't stand up to the Rani's armies. The Rani's, as I said, if they didn't like a husband, they could discard the husband and take another. They could have more than one husband at any given time. So the Rajas were always a little colorless compared to the women. But by the coming, with the coming of the British, this starts obviously to change and there's a shift towards men in power starts tilting in their favor. But by the time the junior Rani's son comes to power in 1932, patriarchy is firmly established and the British start supporting her because they're like, your son is the Raja, he can do what he wants. So the senior Rani who once controlled ancestral estates and all decisions in the family, she was the head of the family, that position is taken away from her. The, she's told, look, the Raja is the eldest male, he, he may be your nephew, he may be younger than you, but you must listen to him. He's the one who will take all the decisions. So she and her daughter start getting very frustrated with life here because they have no status at court. They get more and more isolated. They leave Trivandrum and start living in a village. And to me, one of the most fascinating persons in the book is her daughter because the daughter becomes this huge rebel. And 1947, there's independence, by which time she's done something very unorthodox. She leaves the palace premises and she takes a house next to the palace, an old Brahminical style house with a courtyard. And she goes and lives there with her, uh, uh, with her children and she says, I don't want to be a princess. I want to lead my own private life. So she leaves a palace full of 300 servants and all that protocol, takes a few people and starts living in this house. In 1949, she does the unthinkable by moving to Bangalore. And overnight, Princess Uttram Tirna Lalitamba by Tamburan of Travanko becomes Mrs. Lalita Varma. And she gives up all her titles. And she transforms herself in some really you know, I I intriguing and you know, very endearing ways. So she goes to the Bangalore club, for instance, and an old lady at the Bangalore club told me that when she first came there, she went to the shop at the Bangalore club. And she's very impressed. She saw all these little women, you know, with baskets, putting things into them and taking them home. So she also went through the whole store and picked things, put them in the basket. And as she's walking out, someone said, Madam, that's 80 rupees. She sort of looked at them saying, you know, why is everyone talking about rupees? What are these rupees? Because she had no conception of money. Because as a princess, she never had to deal with money. And then her manager at the back said, you know, let her go, I'll pay. And then from being someone like that who'd never heard of a rupee and had to ask her husband what on earth the rupee was, 
she started driving her own car, cooking in her own kitchen, gave up all the servants, cleaning her own house, you know, gave up all the palaces, never went back to Kerala, insisted that her children go to public schools and start and drop their titles and all pretensions to royalty. And they start moving with a democratic India. They actually enjoy, because for them, independence was freedom for them as well, because they were stuck in the palace under the junior Rani's control. The moment independence came, they were free. And so they always called it a gilded cage. So you were petted and, you know, fated and all of that. But it was only when you were alone you realized you lived in a cage. And the daughters then, you know, they, she's got five daughters. All of them build up careers for themselves. They all have independent lives. They, they're all very eccentric characters in their own rights. And in fact, the husband of this princess, this Lalita Mbabai, who left the palace and moved to Bangalore, he's still alive and he turns 100 years in uh, May. And he's the last of these consorts. And that marriage is also interesting because she was going in a procession in Trivandrum in a palanquin and all of that. And somewhere, her parents had told her, you need to get married now, you're 16. And somewhere, she saw a group of boys and she saw this man in that. So she came home to her parents who were sitting in the library and sort of looking at proposals and horoscopes. And she said, oh, why do you need to stop looking at this now? I've selected someone. And they were a little aghast. They said, what do you mean you've selected someone? She said, oh, at this, this place on the street, I saw this man, I'm going to marry him. Now, they said, you know, Ranis have the privilege of choosing their husbands, but you can't quite sweep a man off the streets of Trivandrum and bring him home. <laughs> Luckily, it turned out he was from the aristocracy, so he was suitable. And the, the thing was, this man was then brought. Uh, they had this secretary, the social secretary to the royal family who came and taught him, you know, table manners and etiquette and so on. Then he was taken to Madras and uh, good suits and other things were stitched and tailored for him. Then he was brought back and taken to the temple in Trivandrum, where the wise and old Brahmin priest went up to him and gave him a lesson in how not to make love to a princess of Travancore. What you can do and what you can't do. Because remember, you are not, she's not merely your wife, she's also the princess of Travancore. So you can't do what you want. You have to be very cautious and very respectful. And this Lalitamba Bai had this, I mean, she, she caused a great fuss in Travancore by sharing a bedroom with him. Otherwise, the husbands were not allowed to share the same bedroom. They only visited the Rani's when they were invited. Otherwise, they had their own houses on the palace, in the palace compound, but outside the main building. So she innovated all of this. She again went off to Bangalore and became Mrs. Uh, Lalita Varma, wife of Mr. Kerala Varma and so on. And this gentleman's still alive. And it was only after the book you know, was over and they sent me this 100th birthday invitation that I thought, my God, this man's turning 100. And I've always thought of him as a character in the book. And you know, this man's still alive. And he's the last of the consorts of Travancore, you know, picked off the streets when he was a BAC student at the Maharaja's College in Trivandrum. And overnight, he was exalted into this position of you know, royal husband where he all he had to do for the first 10 years of his life before independence was play the veena, you know, paint, <laughs> sit in the palace because he had nothing to do. He wasn't allowed to work. So, you know, they, they, they're really interesting characters and the story ends with how all these people pass away and, you know, how they sort of lose touch with their culture. And years later, before her death, someone asked her something and the Land Sealing Act came to force, urban land sealing. So her house in Bangalore was three acres and that was too much for one person to own under the new law. So she even had to divide her house. So the bungalow itself, one wing to went, went to one granddaughter, the other wing went to another because one person couldn't own the whole thing. So she, someone came to visit her and she said that once I, had a, once I thought I had a kingdom, but that is gone. Then I thought I had my palace and that is gone as well. Then I thought I had this house, but now I can only say I have this room. And she said it with a smile, but you know, the person who was with her was moved to tears because he had seen her years ago holding court and being a queen. One yes. Um, I just want to congratulate you on the fabulous research. I think mean, your in-depth knowledge is really impressive. And while you while I hear about the book, I can just expect a soap opera being made on it <laughs> <laughs> very soon. That's all the ingredients. <laughs> uh, just very curious, you know, with all your interviews and and research and all the all the characters, which one would you identify yourself most with? As which of the characters? Yeah, there's so many and very. <laughs> If I had to choose, I'd probably go with the junior Rani. For all her villainous <laughs> traits, she was a very interesting character. And I don't think I can be as pious as the senior. I don't think I can be as morally free of blemish as the senior. So I think I'll take the safer option and be the junior, have a little bit of color in my life, and do a little bit of nasty stuff along with a few good things. But I'd definitely connect more with her rather than the senior Rani. The senior Rani was worth admiring, but very difficult to live up to that sort of ideal. I have a question, guys. Yes. In all of your book mysteries, is all based on the historical fact which is proven? Yes. Or you have wrote something which is like you know no. the story? So I was proven. threatened with a lawsuit right at the start by the Junior Rani's family. So I was very, very, very cautious to make sure that everything is footnoted. There's 104 pages of footnotes. Archival material. Everything is archival material. So they can't say very much. 
you know, to me, or they can't file a lawsuit against me because I can just point them in the direction of the archives and say, hey, go file a lawsuit there. Not at all. <laughs> Yes. I think he wants to end. So maybe if you we can, can have questions. Uh, yeah, yeah. In, okay. o over tea, right? Can we yeah, over tea because he would like us to end. Uh -huh. okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you for being a very patient audience. I think I've rambled on a little bit. Thank you. Thank you very much to both of you for the lovely talk. It, uh, it's very intriguing and, and uh, we wish it could have gone longer. Uh, uh, the last part of the ritual is this. Is there is, uh, two small uh, memoirs that uh, we want to give to you. And uh, I would like to call uh, Nandana, if you please come up. Thank you. You know we have something in common because uh, it was the junior. Special, special with you, yeah, S C U. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming. I'm so pleased you could come. Thank you. That's very kind. I'll definitely let them know that you were. Thank you.